Hey, everybody, and welcome back to another Thursday night at Home with Olympus. Um, we're really excited that you could join us again tonight. Um, we are going to be switching gears and talking about a new topic tonight. As you might have seen, we are going to be discussing some macro techniques and the gear to use to get those shots. And today we have a very special guest. This is one of my absolute favorite Olympus photographers. I am very excited to share our evening with Chris McGinnis. Welcome, Chris. Hey, Michelle, how are you? I'm good, how's it going? We have got people from all over the world. We've got a bunch of people from the UK joining us tonight and Germany, oh my gosh. Awesome, I'm well, I'm here in uh, Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. Yeah, and they're having a freakishly warm day in Bethlehem, we right? We are, yeah, 75 <laughs> degrees right now. I'm out in California and it's colder here than it is in Pennsylvania and it's not fair. <laughs> So what are you going to share with us tonight? What are you going to touch on tonight? I'm going to talk about macro photography, which will come as no surprise for anyone that uh, knows my work. Um, but specifically, we're going to dig a little bit more into two things, one being the 60 millimeter f2.8 macro lens and kind of how to get the most out of that lens. Uh, it can be a little bit tricky uh, or overwhelming for some people at first. And then we're going to go into focus bracketing and stacking what those things are, how to do them, uh, some different techniques and considerations. Awesome. Well, I will let us get started here. Um, as always, we will be answering questions in the comments as often and quickly as we can, both on Facebook and YouTube. Thanks for joining us on both of those. Um, if you don't, or if you have questions specific for Chris, we will try to get those up at, during breaks and segments, and then we'll have time for a Q&A at the end. But don't worry, if we don't get your question right away during the segment, we will try to get you those answers in the hours to come. So okay. go ahead and let's get your let's get your nice presentation up here. All right, I'll see you there later, Chris. Is. All right, thanks, Michelle. All right, so here we are talking about macro photography. Um, some of you may have joined last spring. Uh, I think it was May. I did a presentation here on Facebook Live with Get Olympus. Uh, if you didn't see it, it is still available on demand. You can check that out. Um, that presentation was more about macro photography in general, my approach to macro techniques that I use and things like that. Uh, there will be a little bit of overlap with this presentation, but if you're watching uh, and starting out and you're thinking like, oh, I've already seen this, stick around. We really are going to dig into the 60 macro and focus stacking uh, and focus bracketing like I mentioned. So hang in there and uh, obviously I'll be here ready to answer any questions you have if you've got one in mind already. You can put that into the chat at any time, uh, and then we'll have Q&A at the end. So here up on the screen, you see my social channels, Facebook and Instagram. I invite everybody to join me there, connect, send questions anytime you have them, uh, or check out my website, uh, and you can reach out to me through that as well. All right, so the agenda for today. First, we're going to cover a little bit about me, who I am, and why I'm here talking to you. I'm gonna get right into sample photos. I've got some different examples that were achieved through different techniques, uh, mostly of insects and spiders. The Olympus Advantage, why Olympus is great for macro, why I like it, why uh, I think it's a good choice. My macro gear, mastering the 60 as I mentioned, focus bracketing and stacking as I mentioned, and then my camera settings where I start as a baseline, and then the live Q&A. All right, so about me. I'm a macro photographer. I've been shooting Olympus since 2007, and I've been concentrating specifically on macro since 2016, so about five years now. Uh, I'm based in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. I live here with my wife and our twin five-year-old girls. And as I mentioned a minute ago, I'm really focused on uh, spiders and insects. Didn't really start out with that objective, and uh, I'll talk a little bit about how that came to be. But now, if you see me posting, that's probably 90% of what you'll see in my feeds. Uh, I've actually worked for Olympus for 14 years. Over that time, uh, I've worked in creative services the whole time and have supported all of Olympus's businesses, medical, consumer, or corporate divisions. Uh, most recently, I'm focusing solely on uh, medical and corporate, but it's awesome to be here 
still partnering with Olympus as a photographer and getting to connect with all of you. All right, now into sample photos. First up, we've got uh, horsefly. This is a female horsefly. I'm not sure if everyone can see. I'm going to look over to the side here to see the shooting info. Um, but if you can see it on your screen, you'll note that there's some differences to the photos. And I'll talk through those scenarios later when we get to um, single shots versus bracket series and stacking and so forth. So this was a single frame, uh, all shot with the 60 macro. This was a couple of frames stacked. So this is an example of a focus stack. This is a carpenter ant. And this was uh, stacked with Helic and Focus, which is focus stacking software. Here's another single frame of a mantis shot with the 60 macro. This is a grasshopper that is also stacked, but this example was stacked with Photoshop. So when we talk about stacking, I'll explain uh, how you can stack with different tools, why you might use them, advantages, disadvantages, et cetera. Dragonfly. This is a long-legged fly. One of my favorite photos that I've ever taken for a few reasons, but one of them is it's really, really hard to get a close-up of a long-legged fly. If any of you out there are familiar with macro photography, if you work with insects at all, long-legged flies have uh, what is believed to be the fastest response time in the animal kingdom. So they can sense a stimulus faster than your flash can fire. So I think it's like one 250th of a second or something. So basically as fast as your flash can go and as fast as your shutter is going, they're gone. So getting one to cooperate is very difficult, um, but here I was able to shoot a three frame series and then stack that in post to get this really close up of the eyes. Jumping spider, one of my favorite subjects. I shoot a lot of jumping spiders. I can't really pass up a uh, pass up an opportunity to shoot one when I have the chance. On this again, this is a single frame shot. Uh, here's a stag beetle, and this was stacked in camera. Another mantis, much closer. Uh, this was, I believe, five frames, and I stacked this in post with heel can focus. And then here's a single frame of a wasp just as it's taking off from a leaf. So that's kind of a general overview of what I like to shoot, um, what I'm going to talk about here. The examples that I'll give aren't necessarily all, all going to be insects and spiders, but I'm telling you and showing you those examples so you can apply the techniques to shooting in the field, right? So I'll always advocate for practicing with what I'll call inanimates, right? Just stationary objects or practicing um, in, inside with inanimates or outside with inanimates so you can get all your settings right. So you can learn your lens, learn your camera. Because when you go out into the field and you find a really cool insect or spider and you're like, oh, that I want to get a photo of. I want to get those photos that I saw on Instagram that I really like that, that so-and-so takes. You're not going to be able to do that effectively if you don't understand your settings and your camera first and your lens first, especially because insects and spiders move. And one of the Main questions I get, and maybe one of you are thinking about this right now, is, well, how do you get your insects and spiders to stay still? Well, they usually don't. Um, I miss a lot of shots, but you have to be able to maximize the opportunities when you get them. And by setting yourself up for success in learning your gear in advance, uh, you can really have a better chance at getting those shots. So the Olympus advantage for macro. Olympus cameras, uh, lenses, flashes, especially the OMD line, a lot of them are weather sealed. So that's great when you're out in the elements. Um, it's a compact, lightweight system, especially lenses are really small, really portable. Five axis in-body image stabilization, dedicated macro lenses. Uh, as I've talked about already, I'm talking about the 60 a lot tonight. Love the 60. Uh, the price tends to be more accessible in a lot of cases than some other brands. Uh, this one's really important, more depth of field versus full frame. So if you're coming from another system, 
or you've read things online, or maybe you're concerned with, oh, I heard that Micro Four Thirds cameras, uh, they don't, they have more, they don't have as much bokeh. You don't get that shallow depth of field. Now, anyone that shot with Olympus understands that that's not necessarily the case, but with macro, you want more depth of field because these razor thin focal planes are really tough to get a lot of your subject in focus. And that's why we employ things like focus bracketing and stacking. But by nature, Olympus allows you to get more depth of field, um, which is better results for those single frame shots too. So that's really awesome for macro. Um, you get more magnification due to crop factor. I'll talk about that later in the presentation. Uh, wireless control, if you're into using your camera remotely, you can use the OI Share app. Great JPEGs. So I shoot JPEG plus RAW, and I'll use the JPEGs a lot when I'm just out and want to send an image right to my phone. And I'll use the JPEG for that. Uh, otherwise, I'm back at my computer with the RAW. And then savable, shareable custom settings. And that's really great if you have multiple bodies, if you have a second shooter, not just for macro, but say you're a wedding photographer and you want to save your settings and share them with a second shooter, things like that. So all of that, I feel, is a major advantage for Olympus with macro. Um, so let's get into my gear and Olympus gear. So Olympus gear first, then my specific gear next. I won't spend too much time on the Olympus gear in general. I just want to show everyone so you know what Olympus gear is available for you in macro. So we've got the OMD series, Olympus Pen, and Tough. OMD series, that's your high-end, serious shooters, lots of functions. Pen, really good quality, still quite a few functions, maybe not as many as the OMD series, but uh, perfect for like those stepper-uppers from a cell phone camera, or maybe you just want something super portable, Pen's great for that. And then the tough cameras, which are your go anywhere, do anything, underwater, shock proof, freeze proof, et cetera. But uh, they also have microscope mode, super microscope mode, microscope control mode. So the tough cameras are really awesome for macro as well. And there's some great macro accessories for tough cameras. Olympus lenses that I consider to be really the best options for anyone that likes macro. The 30, that's your entry level, super easy to use. I don't feel like there's much learning curve with the 30. Uh, 60, which I'm gonna talk a lot about today. That's serious macro, it's weather sealed. It's still very compact, only just over three inches long. Um, it's gonna yield 2X magnification. Uh, and I'll talk about magnification shortly. Uh, and it's still a fast prime, it's an f2.8 lens. So you don't have to just use it for macro. Some people like to use it for portraits and other things as well. 40 to 150 and 300, I'll pair together as I talk about them. They're telephoto lenses, right? They're your big, long lenses. Not traditionally macro, but they do have close working distances, which I like to use for longer range, pseudo macro insect photography, things like butterflies and dragonflies, like things like that. Flashes. I'm not going to go into the details on each one. Um, you can take a look online at these flashes or just read what I have here. Uh, I prefer the FL700WR in this lineup. Uh, some people, macro shooters, will go to the FL900 or the twin flash. They're all great. They all have different kind of style of shooting, but uh, lots of options. And all three of the bigger flashes, other than the FL LM3, are weather sealed. So that's great. So you can have a weather shield camera, lens, and flash together. So now we're into my stuff, right? This is what I shoot. I go out into the field. This is what I'm going to use. I've got the EM1. I've got the 60 macro, 40 to 150 pro, and FL 700 flash. On top of the flash, we're going to put a diffuser. So I've actually got one here. So we've got an FL700 with homemade softbox on it. Um, I have a secondary foam diffuser that I'll put on the end of my lens. The one in the center there, that's the Cygnus diffuser. So if you follow Cygnus Tech on Instagram, uh, he makes those out of Australia and ships them around the world. They're all serving the same purpose. They're going to do a little better job than one another, a little worse job, 
slightly different diffusion, slightly different effect. But the idea is you're going to have a light source being your flash very close to your subject. And you want to soften that light so you don't get hot spots, you don't get deep shadows. You want really nice, even soft light on your subject. And your diffuser is going to do that for you. Um, so these are homemade examples, uh, with the Cygnus Tech being homemade and then shipped out to you. There's also commercial, you know, you go on Amazon.com or BH or wherever, and you can get um, pre made diffusers as well. But a lot of macro shooters, myself included, like to go this route because there's a little more customization. You can fine tune what works for you. And then a uh, few other items that I like to use some are Olympus, some are not on this screen. I've got the 1.4 teleconverter, MC14. That's what I use on my 40 to 150. Uh, that's a little extra reach for the 40 to 150 Pro. A Raynox DCR250. So that's a diopter uh, super macro converter. And that goes over the lens. So that can go over virtually any lens. I use it over my 60 macro. And that gives me a slight increase in magnification for the really small stuff. Um, it can be a little challenging to work with. It screws up your autofocus a little bit. It limits your depth of field, but it will give you that extra magnification. So I'll show an example of that in a few minutes. Extension tubes, these are very common, especially for entry level macro, especially if you need to increase your magnification uh, beyond what your macro lens is capable of. Uh, extension tubes are a great way to do that, and they're pretty inexpensive. EP13 Extra Large Eye Cup. So it may sound silly, but the standard eye cup that comes on the Olympus cameras, nothing wrong with it, but the Extra Large Eye Cup really seals out light from all directions, and I find it a little more comfortable. Uh, and then I use rechargeable batteries. Those are for my flash. Um, I use the SanDisk cards, but I don't find that for macro, uh, the highest speed, highest grade cards are all that important, like with some other uh, like high action sports or um, birds or something like that. And then finally, software and apps. Oh, I share, that's the Olympus app that lets me transfer images wireless to my phone. Uh, also allows me to shoot remotely. I don't do that much for macro, but uh, it's a really nice feature. Lightroom, that's where the bulk of my processing happens. So I finish shooting, I bring my images into Lightroom, I process them there. I then finish the images usually in Photoshop. Um, I'm very comfortable in Photoshop. I've been a graphic designer for over 20 years and uh, I kind of have lived in Photoshop for the better part of that time. So Photoshop's really comfortable for me and I like to finish my images there. Um, and then Heal Can Focus is shown here and that's specifically for focus stacking. That's literally all the software does, uh, but it does a really good job of it. So we're gonna talk about focus stacking in camera, but I want you to know that there's also options out of camera. And I'll cover a couple of those options as well. All right, so we've got a question here. Is there a notable difference between extension tubes and the macro lens? Um, I would say the best quality is always going to come from a dedicated macro lens. I'm looking at the extension tubes as a way to extend the macro lens, not to extend a kit lens or a portrait lens or prime or something. But it's a great way to get into macro. Uh, you know, very inexpensive way. You can you've got another lens already. You want to try it out, but. I would say nine out of 10 times, if you do like it, you're going to want to spend the money and get that really uh, kind of purpose-built lens in a dedicated macro. Mastering the 60 millimeter macro. So this lens is widely praised. Most people that have it uh, really like it. I'm definitely in that category now, but I was not when I first got the lens. So in, I think, 2015, I'd been shooting uh, with an OMD for about a year. I was like, oh, I really like macro. I want to get into that. And I ordered the 60 macro. I had never used it before, but I knew that it was a good macro lens. And I wasn't good at it. It didn't come easily to me. 
I saw all these insect and spider photos and different abstract macro things, and I wanted to shoot them, but I wasn't getting that detail. I wasn't getting that clarity. I wasn't lighting anything properly. Like nothing was really working out. So I pretty much put the lens away for like a year and just forgot that I had it. Finally, I realized, okay, I spent money on this thing. I bought it for a reason. I am going to learn it. I took it back off the shelf, put it back on the camera, started watching YouTube videos, reading articles. And I realized there's some bit of a learning curve. Um, not super hard. You just have to realize that it's not like every other lens. And I learned about magnification. I learned about the magnification display on the lens. I started understanding the one-to-one -one shortcut, the focus limiter. I'm going to talk about those thing, uh, things in just a minute with all of you. And then understanding autofocus versus manual focus for macro. And my knee-jerk reaction when someone says, oh, to use autofocus or manual, I usually say manual, but it's not entirely true. And I'm going to explain the difference of when autofocus is appropriate. All right, first up, we've got the magnification display. So on the 60 macro, and if you're looking at me, I'm holding it here in my hand, but up on the screen, there's a nice close up, a macro shot, if you will, of the magnification display. So this is a visual indication of how magnified your result will be. So one to one is a very popular term with macro photography, and that means that your subject will appear on the sensor in the camera the same size as it is in real life. So if that doesn't make any sense to you, I'll try and explain a little further. Um, the micro four thirds sensor is about 18 millimeters wide. So if your subject is 18 millimeters wide, when you're at one to one, that subject will touch the edges of your frame entirely, right? So it's full size in real life. Now, if you go one, uh, one to two, that's half. So that means your 18 millimeter subject will fill nine millimeters of your sensor, which is effectively half of the sensor. And vice versa, if it was two to one beyond the capability of uh, the 60 macro, if you were using extension tubes or something else, or even different lens that went beyond one to one, uh, say it was two to one, your 18 millimeter subject would only half fit in the frame. So hopefully that makes sense. If anyone has questions, uh, you know, throw them out there and I'll see if I can maybe answer in a different way or explain a little bit more clearly. Then we have um, the distances on the right-hand side. So on the left, we have one to one, one to 1 1.3, one to 1 1.2, one to four. So that's full size to a quarter size. And on the right, we have 0 0.19, 0 0.2, 0 0.23, 0 0.34, and those are meters. Uh, so I know a lot of the viewers are probably from the US here, as I am. So in feet, we have 0 0.62, 66, 76, and 1.11 feet. I kind of wish those were in inches because that's a little easier for me, but we're talking about seven and a half inches or so here, maybe eight inches, uh, nine and a half inches, and about 14 or 15 inches. But you have to remember that these are subject to sensor. And your sensor sits behind the lens inside the camera. So you've got your distance from the subject to the glass, the glass to the sensor, and you have to add those together. What's really cool, and I just realized this after years of macro, that the minimum working distance with the 60 millimeter macro is about three and a quarter, three and a half inches. So is the lens. So if you can mentally ballpark when you want to shoot one to one, meaning I want to get maximum magnification for this image, I need to be about one lens distance away from my subject. Um, so I've shot enough with the 60 where I can just kind of go right to that spot and come within half an inch of my minimum working distance. But uh, I think that's a good frame of reference for everyone. 
So while we're talking about magnification, I mentioned sensors a little bit. I put this together because I know that some people may be familiar with other systems. Some people may not really understand what I'm talking about with magnification. So here's a couple of uh, pot, there are three popular systems. We've got full frame, APS-C, and four thirds, micro four thirds. The sizes of the sensors, uh, no surprise, full frame's the biggest of the three, micro four thirds is the smallest, and then the result on magnification. So versus, I'll just talk full frame to four thirds right now, versus full frame, micro four thirds is going to yield a result that's effectively twice as magnified. Because the sensor is half the size, it's one to one, and that ratio is sensor to subject. So sensor size to subject of a half size sensor is twice the result. So hopefully that light math there makes sense, but if it doesn't, just look at the pictures, right? One to one uncropped result. That's the most I can get with a one to one full frame lens and a full frame camera. This is the most I can get with a one to one full uh, micro four thirds lens on a micro four thirds camera. And I'm gonna run through the examples here. Uh, so this is going to serve two purposes. One, you get to see the indicator here in the corner. So right now it's at one to four or one fourth. You'll see the magnification, what that does, and you'll see this indicator move as we move through the slides. So there's half, there's one to 1.3, and that's one to one. And then here they all are compared to one another. Okay, so now hopefully that connects the dots of what that indicator is doing and showing you and how you can use it to gauge how much magnification you're going to get. If you wanna go further, I mentioned the Raynox, I mentioned extension tubes, uh, this is how they're going to affect your magnification. So as you can see, the Raynox DCR250 and a pair of extension tubes, a common pair is a 10 and 16 millimeter tube. They're going to give you very similar magnification. So it's a preference. Uh, I like the Raynox a little better, mainly because I can pop it on and off quickly, um, but they're both perfectly fine options to expand or extend magnification. Uh, and then the 60 on its own is on the left. Probably 90% of the time, that's how I'm shooting, the 60 on its own. I feel like that's how the lens works the best. Um, it's the easiest. I get the best results or the highest hit rate anyway. And then when I really want that extra magnification, I'll reach for something uh, to give me a little extra. All right, on to the focus limiter. So the focus limiter is that little dial on the side of the 60 macro. And it's very easy for someone that's unfamiliar with it or unfamiliar with that particular lens or macro lenses to ignore it, to just leave it however it came out of the box. And if you do that, you're going to be very frustrated. Um, or if you forget to use it or don't understand how to use it, you're going to be very frustrated. The focus limiter is used to limit the range in which autofocus will seek. So I'll explain that a little further. It has three settings, 0.19 to 0.4 meters, and I have the approximate inches uh, in parentheses there, 0.19 meters to infinity, or 0.14 meters to infinity. And you just click that dial into one of those three positions depending on how far away your subject is going to be and what you want to focus on. This is incredibly helpful. I literally just said the words that I wrote in the presentation without looking at them. This is incredibly helpful because you can ensure that you focus on what you want to focus. So a lot of times when you're in the field, there's leaves, there's sticks, there's flowers, there's things that are just, uh, they're near your subject, but you don't want to focus on them. And if you don't use the focus limiter and you're in autofocus, you are accidentally going to catch them with your focus and you're not going to catch your subject. And it's really frustrating. So you limit the focus to the distance away that your subject is. And now you have a much greater chance of catching that focus rather than something uh, you know, undesirable. For macro, I'm typically in 0.19 to 0.14, or to 0.4 rather, 
that's the forward position. And it's just before the one-to-one -one shortcut, which I'll talk about next. Um, the Get Olympus account posted one of my images on Instagram earlier today, and a question came in of why would you use 0.4 meters to infinity over 0.19 meters to infinity? Well, say you're shooting and there are branches in front of you, which happens all the time. Like I'm going into a bush or some sort of shrub or something, and there's insects inside. I don't want to accidentally shoot on the or uh, focus on the things that are too close if I'm trying to focus on some further. So you just have to flip that switch to what's appropriate, and then your autofocus is going to have a much easier time, uh, and you're going to get what you want. All right, the one-to-one -one shortcut. This one can drive you crazy if you don't know how to use it. And the reason it can drive you crazy is because you will think it's not working. So this shortcut instantly brings your lens without hunting and seeking with the autofocus, without turning the barrel like you would do with uh, another lens if you're manually focusing or zooming. Instantly brings you to one-to-one. -to -one. So maximum magnification at the flick of a switch. But it's spring-loaded. It's not a position on the dial like 0 0.19, 0 one nine to infinity and 0.4 to infinity. It's just a shortcut. So you hold it forward. As you see in the picture here, my thumb is holding that switch forward. And when you release it, it comes back to 0.19 to 0.4, meaning you've set it to 0.19, which is one to one. If you hit autofocus, if your camera set to autofocus at that point, you're going to override that because now you've said, I want to go to one-to-one, -to -one, and then afterwards you said, oh, oh, just kidding, I want to go to wherever this thing I'm focusing on is. So you have a couple of choices in that scenario. And this took me a little while to sort out from like an execution point of view. You can just hold it. You can have your one hand to your eye or you know however you're holding the camera if you're looking to the LCD, and a thumb or index finger on the shortcut and just hold it forward. If you're holding it, to one to one, that spring is pushing against you. But if you hold it down, you'll stay locked to one to one. What I like to do is once I go to one to one, flip my camera from autofocus to manual focus. Then I'll stay in one to one until I tell the camera not to be in one to one. Um, now, the 60 macro does not have a focus clutch. So if you're familiar with some other Olympus lenses like the 40 to 150 or the 17 to 18 or there's a few of them that have a uh, manual focus clutch, and that's a physical switch. It's a ring type switch that uh, changes autofocus to manual focus. 60 doesn't have that, but you can map autofocus, manual focus toggling to a function button. So I use the record button. So when I'm shooting macro, I'm not shooting any video. So the record button, which is uh, on the top right corner of the camera, that becomes my MFAF toggle. I can instantly go from autofocus to manual focus and stay there and then kick back if I need to. So really, really helpful. Once I figured that out, you know, how to manage the spring-loaded nature of the switch, how to kick over from AF to MF, things got a lot easier for me. And I think I covered everything there. Perfect. So on to manual. Uh, versus autofocus. <clears throat> so I said a minute ago that my default answer is, oh, I use manual focus for uh, macro. And I do, but I don't use it exclusively. So when I use manual focus, so I've got a camera in my hands, and if you can see the thumbnail, uh, take a look there, but I'll explain. I'm focusing, yes, I know there's a lens cap on, um, but I'm moving the camera in and out. So when I'm in manual focus, I'm gently moving toward and away from my subject until I see it entirely in focus on my LCD or in the EPF. I'm not, um, like if you were manual focused on another lens and you're just turning the barrel to fine tune the focus, I'm very rarely using, I'm not, I'm not using 
that technique. I'm moving forward and back very gently until I see focus. Um, but that's when I'm in manual focus. As I'm approaching my subject and I'm further back than that minimum working distance, that one lens length away, three inches or so, I'm in autofocus. I move toward my subject. I tap autofocus. It helps me find my subject in the viewfinder very quickly. I move forward a little bit more, tap autofocus. And then once I get close enough that I think, okay, I want to move to one to one here, then I can hit my one to one shortcut, hit the button for manual focus, and then I'm moving in and out. But I might never get that close. The subjects that I'm aiming to shoot don't always allow it. So I would rather get a shot with autofocus on my way in, still get a shot that might be very usable or that I'm really happy with, rather than try to go in close or try and go right into manual focus and not get anything. So I always promote trying to get a shot before getting the shot. So as you approach, you can get a shot. It might not be the shot you had in your head, but as you're moving, you're getting shots, and then you worry about high magnification. So autofocus is best for beginners, best for fast-moving subjects. You know, you're not going to manually focus on something that's darting around. Um, or even if you are, it might just be easier and uh, give you more success to use autofocus. And uh, as I mentioned a second ago, finding your subject in the LCD. When you're working at really high magnification, your eyes up or your camera's out in front of you, it can be really hard to find a tiny subject. You, know, you see it with your eye outside the viewfinder, you put the viewfinder to your eye and you don't know where the heck that thing went. So autofocus can really be helpful for that. And then manual focus, as you get more experienced, more comfortable, you can start relying more on manual focus. Uh, really good for stationary or slow moving subjects when you don't have that concern about them running away or flying away. And then maintaining a consistent magnification from shot to shot. We're gonna talk about focus bracketing and stacking in a second, and that's where it becomes important because if you're using autofocus, you're gonna get one photo at one to one, one photo at 1.3 to one, one photo at one to two, and they're gonna be all over the place and you're not gonna be able to stack them. So you really need consistent magnification from frame to frame in order to effectively stack. So it can be really useful and important there. Nailing focus. Nailing focus. Uh, this is with the 60 macro, but not exclusively the 60. Use the focus limiter. It's going to make your life much easier. Uh, you're not going to be fighting the lens if you're trying to focus on something that's outside of its range. Know where you want to focus. So as you start shooting live subjects or even inanimates, if this is product photography or something like that, picking the interesting point of focus on a macro subject is really important. If, for instance, you're photographing a spider, which I have in the example on screen, and you focus on the jaw of the spider, but you miss the focus of the eyes, the shot doesn't look good. You know, we're drawn right into the eyes. So think where you want to draw your viewer's uh, attention and focus on that. So usually with insects and spiders, that's the front plane of the eyes. And that's where I start. And you can move forward and back from there in a bracketed series. But the front plane of the eyes, if that's in focus, that's a great starting point. Um, I just talked about moving your camera forward and away. And then using two tools that are built into the OMD cameras, and that's focus peaking and focus assist magnification. So focus peaking is pretty common. Um, if anybody doesn't know what it is, that's a feature where you can highlight the in-focus areas with a color. So you can set, I think, red, green, yellow, white, um, maybe black. There's a few different color options. Red is the most common, though. Um, and when you focus, whatever is in focus, the camera is seeing as the most focused area, will light up with a red edge to it. So that kind of ensures you, as you're shooting, like, I think it's in focus, but my eyes are deceiving me. The camera's going to tell you, yes, that 
part of the subject is absolutely in focus, and then you can hit your shutter button. The other one that I use more often and I love is the manual focus assist magnify. And that's what you see in the example here. So I have a function button mapped to uh, magnify and I focus on my subject. I'm in it one-to-one. -one. I'm trying to find that perfect focus, gently moving in and out. I touch the magnification button that zooms my LCD or EVF into uh, I think three, five, seven, ten, and fourteen x. So on the screen here, we see seven x. Then you really know what's in focus. So this is just a visual aid. This is showing me really, really closely at seven x what part of my spider is in focus. I hit the shutter button. I don't capture the image at seven x. I capture the image at whatever magnification I was at, probably one to one. But I know that where I want to focus is in focus. So really, really helpful focusing tool. Oh, I see a question up here. Uh, shortcut to quickly go between AF and MF. Yeah, sure. So uh, if you're using the EM1 Mark III or II or EM1X, it's all pretty similar from the super control panel. And I can actually show you if we can kick over to my camera. Perfect, thank you. So this is an EM1 Mark III. And here we have the gear on the super control panel. Right here we have the record button. And if you click over, you can change that button to do whatever you want. I have it set to manual focus. So now when I go back out to the super control panel and I hit that button, if you notice on the left side, you see MF and then you see SAF, that's toggling autofocus and manual focus at the press of the button. So great question. All right. Now we are into focus bracketing and focus stacking. Those two terms are often used together. They're really popular with macro photography. Um, a lot of people don't know what they mean, so hopefully I, I can clearly define them for you or answer your questions if you have them. But focus bracketing refers to shooting a series of images with varying in-focus areas. To shoot a bracketed series, you can use focusing rails, you can use in-camera technology, which we'll talk about now, or you can manually vary your focus points just by moving your camera lens. Focus stacking is actually assembling or compositing multiple images with varied focus points. So you're taking your bracketed series, blending them together to make one image that takes advantage of all those different focus points, but merges them into one image. So a bracketed series is multiple images taken with some variance. Uh, you could vary, or you could bracket uh, exposure, you could bracket ISO, you could bracket anything. We're talking about bracketing focus. And then a focus stack is the stack, right? You put a pile of images together to get the best out of each image. So you can bracket without stacking. You can shoot a bracketed series of anything. You don't have to stack it, but you can't stack unless you've shot a bracketed series. So why would we focus bracket? So here I have a series that I showed that image earlier of the long-legged fly. I actually manually bracketed this series by gently moving my camera while I was in uh, drive mode low, and I shot a series of images. That's the hard way to do it. Uh, I'm going to talk about the easy way in a minute. But uh, I was able to get three shots that I could ultimately stack. So why would we bracket? Well, you can. I put this in here because I do think this is a reason why people bracket, but I don't necessarily recommend it. And that's increasing your chance of hitting perfect focus. I really recommend using the focusing tools, being patient, uh, you know, magnifying your LCD to nail focus. Like that's when you nail focus. If you just squeeze the trigger and move the camera back and forth, anytime I do that, and I still do it, I always miss. Like I'll get 20 photos and they're all close. When if you just take the time to 
really look closely, really slow down, that's when you're going to nail focus. But you might not have an opportunity to do anything else. And you say, look, this is the only time I'm gonna be able to press the button. I gotta make the most of it. You could bracket your focus and that gives you a better chance. Um, capturing a series of image with images with varied focus points so you can choose the most appealing image later. So same scenario, you've got a subject, you know it's only gonna sit still for a second. You say, well, I don't even know what I wanna focus on. I don't know if I'm gonna get it in focus, but I can push the button once. I can take 10 or 15 images with varied focus points and we'll see what I like out of that series. And then the most common reason is because you want to take advantage of those varied focus points, put them together into a focus stack. Why would you focus stack? So there's the result of that bracketed series stacked together. You see that I have the front of the fly's face, the full compound eyes all the way to the back of the head and then going back even just beyond. Uh, nothing in the foreground, nothing in the background in focus, but all of the points where I wanted in focus, they are in focus thanks to the stack. So you can control exactly which areas are in focus, right? So I wanted the head in focus, I can do just the head in focus you can produce a greater perceived depth of field than you can achieve with one frame. Um, now, some people out there might be thinking, well, why not just shoot at F16? And that gives me greater depth of field. I understand how aperture and depth of field work. I will answer that question momentarily. Um, you might want to increase your depth of field, and this kind of partially answers that question, and still, uh, take advantage of what a wide aperture gives you, be it more light hitting your sensor or softer bokeh, or both. Uh, and then produce images with an exaggerated sense of clarity. When you only focus on a razor thin plane, then you stack all of those together, you're going to get something that looks like hyper sharp. And uh, that's a really cool effect. A uh, question coming in about a uh, tripod. So no tripod, but second part of that question was something rigid. Uh, in this case, no, I was just uh, hand-holding freely. I will recommend, especially if you're just starting out or if you don't feel like you have the steadiest hands, brace yourself against something the best you can when attempting to freehand focus stack. Um, if you can lean on the ground or up against a tree or you can brace your shoulder against something we hold, because the steadier you and your camera are, the more successful the stack will be. Um, so it's really, really important that those shots are something that either the camera can align, or if you're using software after the fact, that you can align in software. So how do you do it? Well, there are many choices. I have some of the most popular ones up on the screen here. You can use Photoshop, you can use Olympus Workspace, you can use Helic and Focus, you can use your own stacker, uh, or if you've got an OMD camera, especially the EM1 series, I think called the EM5 series, um, but a lot of the OMD cameras can do it in camera. And that's a huge convenience, especially if this is something you only do once in a while or you just wanna try out. Like, why am I gonna pay for software hundreds of dollars when I can just do it with the press of a button in camera? So how to enable focus bracketing? Because remember, if you want to stack, you have to bracket first. And again, you can bracket without stacking. So these steps on the screen apply in that case, but you cannot stack without bracketing. So I'm gonna go through these, uh, I'm gonna leave this up for a couple minutes so you can digest what's going on here because a lot of people have a hard time finding this in the menus or understanding what's what. But it's really pretty simple. I'm gonna to go to shooting menu two, set bracketing to on, set focus bracketing to on. And then from there, you can enable stacking, set your number of shots, set the focus differential, modify your flash charge time. Uh, it's really nice if you're using Olympus flash. Automatically, the camera and flash talk to each other and the camera knows how long to wait between shots to get the full power of the flash back and recycled in time. If you're using a third-party flash, you may have to set um, a pause in between. So you can set like 0.1 seconds or 0.2 seconds 
to give your flash enough time to recycle. Um, so I can show you real quick on the menu. I'll run through these same screens just so you see how to turn focus uh, bracketing on. So if we could kick over to my camera, maybe. There we go. Um, OK, so I'm going to hit Menu. I'm go to Shooting Menu 2. And bracketing is off. I don't know why. I think it's because I'm plugged in. So I cannot show you this. This is one feature that does not work when I'm plugged into a computer. So let's go back. Sorry about that. Michelle is probably nodding her head yes to that. Um, all right. So the screens that you go through, again, I'll leave it up on the screen for a minute, and I can answer questions about it. Sorry, I can't show you right now. But bracketing in the first screenshot is off. You turn that on. Make sure you hit OK. It's really easy to go to it and then just hit over to the right, and you didn't actually turn it on. You just select it on. So hit OK. Go down to focus bracketing. Turn that on. And then if you want to do stacking, we're in that same menu. You turn stacking on. And then from there, on that same screen in the top left, you see that you have the number of shots that you want to take uh, for your bracket, the focus differential. So that's from three, three to 10, I think. Uh, and what focus differential is, is the space between frames. So how deep you want, or how far apart you want the focus point in space. Um, so low numbers are really close together. High numbers are further apart. So high numbers are going to give you more image and focus as a result. Uh, lower numbers, less image and focus. And again, more frames with more distance or differential, really deep. Lower numbers, really shallow. And then once you go back out to your super control panel, Make sure you see this BKT for bracketing icon in the top. If not, go back through the steps and just make sure you actually hit OK for on. So as I said, it's a really easy mistake to make. I make it all the time. In-camera stacking considerations. So not all cameras and lenses from Olympus are compatible. Third-party lenses, not going to work. You have to have a lens that works with focus bracketing and stacking. So be sure that your lens does. Uh, most of the pro lenses do. Uh, the 60 millimeter uh, and 30 millimeter lens do. So most of the lens you would want to use will work, but if it's not working, maybe the lens. So you'd have to just check on the uh, Learn Center on Get Olympus, and you can see which lenses are compatible. Um, next point is really important. This throws people sometimes. The result in camera is a JPEG but your bracketed frames are raws, okay? So you keep those no matter what. So even if you hate the stack, you've still got all those frames. And you can use those, you can stack them yourself and post. You can use just one of them. So that's really valuable. Um, and you are gonna get about a 7% crop to your image. There's guidelines on the screen. They're gonna show you what area will be cropped out after your stack, but that's just because there's little alignments that have to happen. And in order to get your image back to a rectangle and not have jagged edges, the camera has to uh, crop a little bit out. Using a flash will limit your shutter speed. So bracketing and stacking with a flash versus without works the same. The steps are the same. You turn it on the same way. But you are limited to 1 50th of a second to sync with the flash. Um, so that's in the EM1, Mark II, and three. I think it's a little slower in... Uh, other cameras. So just be aware that if you can't increase your shutter speed, it's because there's an actual limitation. Uh, but not a big deal. It's just something you need to know about. Uh, camera and subject must remain steady. So I did mention that. A uh, question came in on that. Very important to be steady. And always start your bracketed series for a stack with the point closest to your camera's lens. All right, so uh, ironically and appropriately, I posted this image on Facebook today as a memory. One year ago today, I posted this photo. I took it uh, one year and one day ago, I think. 
in my kitchen, uh, and today here I am presenting about this photo. So pretty cool. Um, this is a bracketed series. And as you'll see as I click through these kind of quickly, none of them look great. Some of them, now they look bad, right? Like it looks like a blown shot. But I want this shot because I'm getting the top of the shell in focus. I don't care that this is out of focus. I only want to use this part. Now all the way to the back. Here's my nine frames from the bracketed series. They blend together into this. And that's what it looks like at the end. Okay. So now a little bit of a different example. I shot this yesterday. It was warm out yesterday here in Pennsylvania. And I said, oh, I need a good example for tomorrow. We've got these little crocuses growing in the yard at this time of year. Uh, they open up during the day. So out in the midday sun, I shot this. Uh, this series is F4, one four hundredth of a second at ISO 200. And each one is slightly out of focus looking. Now, the first one looks pretty good because I've got the uh, the pedal that's closest to me in focus, but then you get down to the bottom right corner, you're like, oh, you just missed it. Well, I didn't miss it. I wanted to get the back of, you know, this back pedal here in focus because I'm going to blend all of them together. And I did this in camera, one push of a button after I turned on bracketing and stacking. And like magic, that's the result, okay? So 12 frames, differential was set to eight in this case. Uh, I know someone's probably asking right now or wondering about how do you know how many frames are differential? Uh, I cannot answer that simply. It depends on your subject. It depends on your the size of your subject. It depends on, depends on what you want from the result on how much you want to focus uh, and your working distance. So all of these things come into play. But as a default in my settings, I think I start with uh, six frames with a differential five. And uh, my next example, I think, uses those settings. So one more thing with this crocus, this is that question of, well, why not just shoot F16? I know F16 gives me more depth of field. Why do I have to shoot with focus stacking? Well, F16 is going to give you more depth of field, but it's going to give you less bokeh. It's going to be less dreamy looking. It's going to draw less attention to the area of the image that you want attention on. So that's the result. So I shot these five seconds apart. One was this uh, bracketed series. One was just switched over to F16. And um, not that there's anything wrong with the F16 shot, but what I wanted looks like the shot on the right of the F4 stack. So hopefully this is a pretty clear way for you to understand the difference in the benefit. So here's another series. Yeah, this is six frames, differential of five. And this is with a flash. So I shot this uh, indoors on a tabletop. So a little nut and bolt and washer combination. I chose because it has a lot of like little scratches and dents and things in it. And I'll zoom in in a second so you can see closer. This is F5. So still, you know, pretty large aperture. One uh, fiftieth of a second, which is the maximum I can shoot with a flash and ISO 200. And again, one press of the button, shutter fire six times, flash fire six times. You wait maybe five seconds while the camera produces the image, and then it's done. You get a finished JPEG that is the stack, and that looks like that. So uh, lots of detail here, all the little grooves and machining of the bolt and washer and uh, the nut on top. So here they are side by side, and I wasn't sure how this was going to come through over the stream, so I gave you a little bit of a close-up. So this is the best single frame I could pull from the series. When I looked at it small, I said, oh, that one looks pretty good. Zoom in, mm, not so good, right? I've got some things in focus. Here I can see some detail here on the screw down here. But really, overall, it's not in focus. But that's what the stack looks like. Everything is super sharp. All the things that I wanted to be super sharp are super sharp. So that is it for focus, bracketing, and stacking. So I'm sure there are questions. Happy to answer them in just a few minutes.
But before we get to Q&A, I want to cover my camera settings because everyone always wants to know, well, what settings do you use? How do you shoot? Well, they are not a secret. I will tell you. Um, so I have these mapped to C1 on my custom dial. Um, that I can show you how to do. So if we click over to my camera, I should be able to show you that. And what I'll do, perfect, thank you. So I'm going to hit menu. And well, before I do that, first I'm going to go into my super control panel and I'm gonna pick some settings. So let's just say I wanna set my default ISO to 400. I want to set my white balance to sun. I wanna be in manual focus. Okay, so just kind of mentally remember those. And that's it. Then I hit menu. Right in the first shooting menu, first item, reset custom modes. I'm going to say assign to custom mode. So the settings that I just uh, changed, those are what the camera is remembering right now. I say assign to custom mode. I have one and two set. I can assign to C3, custom three. Hit OK. And that's it. I'll go back out. And now we'll see what happens. Let me change something just so it's obvious. So let's look at ISO. So ISO is 250, whatever. I'll now turn my mode dial to C, sorry, to C3. C3. And get my super control panel. There's everything that I saved to C3. Okay. So when I say that I saved my settings to C1, that's what I need. I've tweaked my baseline macro setup. I can pick up my camera, turn to C1, and I'm um, uh, really close to exactly what I need for most scenarios. All right, so let's go back to the presentation. I think I just have a couple slides left. And on C1, my camera's behaving as manual. That means I'm in manual when I'm setting these settings and assigning to C1. Uh, and the camera will work like it does in manual when I'm in C1. Shutter speed is 1 60th of a second. Aperture is uh, set to f8. Right in the middle, I can go a little up or a little down with just a couple of clicks. ISO 200, that's the native ISO. Uh, white balance, I always leave to auto. Face priority is not needed for my macro subject, so I turn it off. Focus, I have this manual, but I have that button set to AF toggle. Shutter mode to sequential drive mode low, and I have that down to five frames a second. Uh, that's just because I'm often shooting with a flash and I wanna give my flash time, so I don't wanna go super fast with it. Uh, large, super large super fine JPEG plus raw. Image stabilization set to SIS auto. Picture mode is natural and live view boost is on one. Live view boost, if you're not familiar with it, um, that will, increase the brightness of your subject in the EDF or on the LCD, no longer giving you an accurate re representation of exposure. But when you're shooting with a flash, if you don't turn Live View Boost on, everything's going to look dark and you're not gonna be able to see it. So turn Live View Boost on, you get a really nice clear sense of what you're working with, press the shutter button and then your flash does its thing and you get your exposure as it's set. Uh, and then we have Additional settings, these are additional customizations. So focus assist magnify, I mentioned that one. I use uh, the ISO button, which is on the back corner of the EMO Mark III. Uh, you might be asking like, well, why do you use that button and plus minus for ISO? It's a carryover from the button placements on the EMO Mark II. That's how I had it set up. Um, but you can change to whatever you like. The front top function button, have that set to focus peak. Record button, I already talked about manual focus, autofocus, toggle. And then the AEL, AFL button, that's what I use to turn on and off focus bracketing, which uh, is set up to do stacking as well. So typical scenario, shooting a subject, feel like, okay, got what I want. Hey, let's try a stack. Hit that button, take my next shot, and now I've got uh, a bracketed series and potentially an in-camera stack all at once. And that is it, just over an hour. Um, so what kind of questions do we have?
So we actually kind of have a, a lot of questions. We've covered a lot of ground tonight. And so most of these, you did a really great job of addressing. I let them kind of sit and simmer for a while because I knew we had some answers coming. A lot of um, people, though, do want to know where you focus when you're using focus bracketing or stacking. Where's your chosen point? Oh, I see the, the question right there. Yeah, so focus is that closest to me or closest to the glass. So for instance, if I'm focusing on a uh, spider, a uh, jumping spider, and I wanna get from the pedipalps, which are the little appendages in front of the face, they're like not the legs, but the ones above the legs. And then I wanna make sure I get the eye and then I wanna go back into the head. I'll focus on the tip of the pedipalps or palps that are closest to me. Uh, hit the button and then that will step back in space to create the stack. And this one's a little bit more of a technical question, but I do want to address it. Um, Maybe it's you a pretty can. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, just overriding your previous custom settings. So maybe you have a different custom setting set up, but you want yeah. to set a new one up for macro. Sure. Yeah, I can handle that. Um, so depending on which camera you have, uh, there's four C positions on the dial and EM1 mark. Three, so you've got a lot of options there. I use C1 for what I described to all of you. I use C2 for uh, dragonflies and butterflies with my 40 to 150. So that's a good starting point. Now, if you have all four occupied, then you know, you're know you gonna have to make a concession somewhere. But um, what's great is you can override them anytime. I'm not sure if this is maybe what you're asking. Uh, my C1 has evolved over the last couple of years. So I said it a couple of years ago, and then I added a function button to the mix, or I um, changed my default aperture. You know, maybe it was at 7.1. I said, oh, I'm always going to F8. I'm just going to set it to F8 as default. All you have to do is go to C1 in its default state. So turn the camera on, go to C1, change something, and then go shooting menu one, reset custom modes, assign to C1, and it's done. And it's safe for you. That's awesome. And to tie into that one real quick, only because you do have your nice camera set up, uh, somebody is asking about how they assign AEL AFL for bracketing. Do you want to yeah. show us on the camera real quick? Sure can. Cool. So if I wanted to assign uh, AEL AFL, I would just hit OK to bring up the super control panel. I'm going to cut in here too because there's a couple of people with some older um, model cameras that don't have oh, sure. that on their super control panel. And just so you know, if you're trying to get to your buttons and dials um, adjustments, you would go to your menu button and then you would go to the custom menu and somewhere in the B's, B's for buttons and dials, um, in there you'll be able to find this same adjustments that he's making for your button functions. Yes. The M1 Mark III has this really nice, like, top-down side views of the camera. Um, but it's the really other nice. camera, it's not, a, it's not as nice, but, um, so if you have any more three, it's like this, but as Michelle mentioned, it's uh, slightly different, but you just go down the list, oh, there it was, until the A E L A F L button is highlighted, you hit over, and then you pick what you want it to do. So for me, it is bracketing. And that's it, you just hit okay, and then go back out to your, uh, to the control panel or wherever, and we're all set. Awesome. I'm just reading, I'm scrolling through the comments as we go. I'm trying to go back to some of the older ones. Yeah, I no feel problem. like we have addressed a lot of these. You really did cover a lot of ground. There's a lot of comments asking about you doing a presentation on how you use Flash with Macro next time. So keep that one in mind, Chris. Yeah, that, that's the <laughs> hardest one to, uh, to show in a stream like this is because we need kind of the camera showing what I'm doing. And uh, as you saw, the bracketing does not behave nicely with uh, streaming into a computer that uh, disables those functions. So it's tough yes. to show, but uh, if you have specific questions, you can send them over to me. I'm happy to answer the best I can, or, or maybe we figure out a way, or maybe post pandemic, uh, you know, we do something in person. Yeah. And a lot of questions about selecting your differential, which I know you addressed, and that's always a hard topic to cover because it yeah. does take a lot of experimentation and kind of 
getting familiar with how you like to shoot? Yeah, I would say the best way um, to figure it out is not me giving you an answer because like I said, there's a million variables um, and I can't just say, oh, just set it to 10 and eight and you'll be good. Just set something up simple. Like I had that little nut and bolt thing, set it up on a table, start with one and one, then go to 15 and one, you know what I mean? Like go down the list and do like a little science experiment and look at the results. And that's going to help you and you can use that experience out in the field. When you see an insect that is the size of your test, you know like, oh, I know what worked well on that. And if it's bigger or smaller, you can adjust narrower or wider, or more shots or less shots accordingly. But it's definitely something that requires uh, a little bit of trial and error and practice. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I've struggled with it here and there. And there was one question, um, it's been asked a couple of times on here and we've, uh, we did answer it in the comments, but you can use, uh, the high res mode as well when you're shooting mm -hmm. macro, it will work. You just yeah. need a willing subject that's not gonna move around too much. Um, yeah, I, have a <laughs> I, I haven't really played with it much because I'm typically using a flash and I'm moving around a lot, but um, you can definitely produce a ton of detail with high res mode. Yeah, I've used it for some lazy um, grasshoppers that hang out on my jade plants. They just mm -hmm. kind of sit there, they don't move. So it's a great, um, way to test that out if your bug's willing to just hang out and let you get in their face. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Um, all right. I think we've kind of covered most of these. Everybody's asking you to do another one on TG6 specifically. <laughs> okay. And yeah. um, I do have the TG6. So yeah. I, uh, I'm excited, especially, you know, I, I got to kind of play with macro settings and it's a great camera to give to kids because, you know, fingers crossed they, they they can't break it as easily, let's say, right? Like kids are kids, but right. um, it, it is tough for sure. Um, so yeah, it'd be really cool. And uh, there's something, uh, somebody's asking about flash photography. Um, no, so I, I forget what it was, but I do typically shoot with a flash and being in the field is it's a lot different than what I talked about here and shooting things on a tabletop, but I can't stress enough that putting in that practice, and that's why this time of year is great. Like it's just about to get warm. You're just about ready to go outside. Get that macro lens on the camera, practice inside, you know, figure it out. So when you go outside in a month or two months or three months and you're outside all the time, you're not figuring it out then because then you're going to blow shots and you're going to get frustrated. So uh, you'll be much happier. And that's what I wanted to say. Um, I did just uh, write an article up in the Learn Center, and it may have been shared in the chat. I wasn't able to follow along while we were doing the presentation, but um, if you missed anything or maybe uh, I said it in a different way, pretty much everything I said about the 60 macro is uh, noted in that article. So there's uh, some actual documentation there from me. And you can check it out there. And I have an upcoming article on focus stacking and bracketing where I will share some of these examples and probably go into a little bit more detail. So lots of good stuff in the Learn Center. All right, I'm gonna add one more that's kind of geared towards how you shoot. We'll pop that up. Have you ever combined? Uh, macro lines and extension tubes and the Raynox? Yeah, I have, mainly to see like, what's it going to do <laughs> to me it's like it's just a little too hard to use um yeah and the trade-off isn't um isn't really worth it for the type of shooting that i do now there's people that all they want is magnification and they're going to string together all kinds of things you know they're going to put a bunch of extension tubes and they're going to put uh different rainox adapters or microscope objectives on the end of their lens like they're gonna do whatever they can and they get incredible results, um, but it really requires a dead steady camera, usually a controlled environment. So the limit for me is usually just one. That's fair. I have, I struggle with one sometimes. If it's yeah. too much movement and I'm like, oh. Yeah, I'm right. doing this on this presentation right now and they uh, haven't tried macro photography, you will most likely be surprised at how 
much your very tiny movements affect what's happening on the screen or in the viewfinder. Um, just the vibration of your hand is going to have the screen doing this. So, yep. Uh, Sometimes I keep a little, uh, I have a little tabletop tripod that I use and I'll use, just kind of slide it in and out when I'm working so yeah. that my hands, I have shaky hands, so I get real excited when I'm photographing tiny things. <laughs> so. Yeah, I would say that one of my top tips for macro is patience. You know, I say slow down and it's not just slow down physically, it's slow down mentally, uh, mainly because you're going to find more subjects, but also because by relaxing, you're going to shake less. You know, get yourself in, excuse me, in comfortable positions, and then um, you're going to need a better chance of stability too. Mm -hmm. All right, I there's a lot of questions in the chat, and guys, don't worry. I'm, I, I've read a couple of them that we will get responded to. Don't worry. Um, I, I see one up there right now, Michelle, that I want to address uh, because I actually meant to mention it earlier. So. Uh, the question is, just tried focus stacking, got a focus stacking error, image composition failed. Yeah, so that is uh, common. And it's common 95% of the time because you as the photographer screwed up. And I don't mean that as an insult, but like you, you moved, right? Or, you know, like the subject moved. So maybe it's not you as a photographer, but your subject uh, didn't cooperate, right? So that's why it's super important for you to be dead steady, your subject to be dead steady, and then you'll really reduce the chance of that error. But the saving grace is that even if the stack fails in camera, you get all the frames. Yep. So what you can do, say you shot a 10 frame bracketed series and you want to stack it in camera, you get failed. But frames one through five and seven through 10 are awesome but the bug like twitched in the middle of it and threw off your stack. And that's why the composition failed. You can take frames one through five and seven through 10 as a series, just take out the bad one and stack it in Photoshop or you can focus or whatever yourself. Uh, or you can take a part of that series. So you still get those frames and they're still valuable. Um, you may have just missed that stacking camera. So. Uh, don't feel bad. Uh, you know, so I say that you know you screwed up, but it could have been your subject, or it could have been a number of other factors. So, but that is uh, pretty common, and usually you just try again, right? You try again, and it'll work the next time. Yeah. But it's it's basically telling you that something isn't aligning. Uh, it's not receiving a series as expected to produce a stack, so it can't do it. Awesome. Yes. I've definitely done that. Again, when I try to handhold things and I'm too shaky. Yeah. I got That's, it. Usually I got it. <laughs> That's usually when I mess mine up. <laughs> yeah, I never right. bring a tripod with me ever. I'm not shooting a tripod. So I'm handholding everything. And if I want to do a stack, I just brace myself or lean against something the best I can. Um, and I still produce a lot of stacks. So it's very much possible. Yeah. Well, I... I really, unless you want to answer any more, and you're welcome to. I'm just trying to be conscious of everyone's time tonight, including yours. And you've done a great job speaking for us tonight. We really appreciate it. Yeah, well, um, I will go through all of the questions in the feed uh, tonight, tomorrow, over the next couple of days, and I'll try to answer all of them. Um, if a question is asked multiple times or we addressed it here in the q and I might not answer it. So uh, don't feel bad if I skip over <laughs> yeah. yours. But I'll try to get to all of them. Again, follow me on Instagram and Facebook, and you can send me questions directly. Uh, if you don't have them now, but you have them in a month, um, you know, reach out. And you know, I want to say thank you to Michelle, thank you to Amanda, thank you to Ted, you know, everyone on the Olympus team. Uh, thank you to my wife who's dealing with the children at the moment. Uh, <laughs> thank you to all of you for for joining and all of your questions and being interested in what I have to say. Yes. And just to clarify for everybody, because I am I've seen this come through 20 times tonight. Yes, this is recorded. As soon as we are done, this will live on YouTube and Facebook. So you can react to this presentation again at a later date because I know a lot of people came in late or maybe missed parts of it. And I also would like to thank our team, Ted, Amanda, everybody, and Chris's Chris's wife, who is an angel for uh, taking care of the kids so that we could have this extended home with Olympus session tonight.
I appreciate everyone on our team and we appreciate all of you. Thank you for spending another Thursday night with us. And we definitely look forward to seeing you in two weeks on a Thursday night again. Have a great night, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, everybody.